When we talk about the residential school experience, we're talking uh, over 100 years. I said directly impacting 150,000 uh, young, innocent uh, children. And for the longest time, and I'm talking years and years, our community um, wasn't willing and probably unable to, to confront this part of our, uh, this significant part of our experience. And it took a lot of uh, people to uh, bring, a, bring us to the point where we could actually speak about it within families, uh, communities, and, and then, uh, of course, uh, publicly so that we could share with Canadians this uh, part of their history as, as well. It isn't just an experience or a history of our community, it's uh, Canada's uh, experience, it's Canada's history. The impacts of the legacy of, of residential schools still feels like a, a long shadow cast over the hearts and minds of not only First Nations, uh, direct survivors of the experience, um, uh, the generation that came after, which includes me. I think though it's also casting a dark shadow, a long shadow across the entire country. Um, one that requires, in, in that case, uh, for light to be shone. And that's what's happening at this moment. It feels like uh, the moment that we're in, the moment that we're heading into, uh, into the near and uh, medium and, and far future is one of exposing, telling the truth. And really it's about, uh, in that respect, learning. Um, perhaps unlearning uh, what people thought, the myths, uh, uh, the stereotypes, if you will the misunderstandings, uh, the gaps in, in uh, real information. Uh, that's all now coming to light. Everything from nutrition experiments to six-year-olds having their tongues pricked when they tried to speak the only language that they knew how to when they went to school for the first or, or second time um, as kids. And that's the moment that we're in. So it's a legacy of, uh, of overcoming uh, deep misunderstanding and now arriving at a place of learning uh, and greater understanding. On the one hand, the settlement agreement represented a real expression of uh, the deepest uh, um, um, rightful anger, um, disgust at uh, historic policy that really sought to tear families, uh, uh, tear them apart, tear children from their identity, from their family, from their elders, from their lands, from understanding and being supported to be anchored in their treaties and their rights uh, that they had inherited from their ancestors. And uh, that is a, uh, a terrible legacy, and, and the settlement agreement represented uh, really confronting Canada in, in a way that can only be described as such because it came out of a court settlement agreement that uh, survivors, based on their incredible resilience, strength, determination, and courage, said, we will not allow for this legacy to go unconfronted. And we're going to stand up for ourselves, uh, for those that are coming behind us, to make sure we do exactly that. And it's the courage of people like my uh, former colleague on the National Executive, former National Chief Phil Fontaine, courageously telling his story, which mirrored the stories identically to those in my own family. And I'm thankful for those survivors for standing up and doing exactly that. And in, in essence, dragging Canada to the table to say that you must confront uh, this terrible chapter in our shared history. And you have to understand how you as a state perpetrated this and it must end here. And that is really, I think, the significance of the settlement agreement, the great courage that it took for those to come around the table, um, you know, under arduous circumstances to, to come to a settlement agreement that created uh, the common experience payment, uh, the independent uh, assessment um, payments, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and also the credits, uh, personal credits for education. All really important structural recognition that something went wrong and by no means a full account of full justice for this tragedy. But perhaps, uh, as some in my family have said, a measure of justice. There wasn't a single thing that was easy. I mean, this didn't happen overnight. The government didn't come to us and say, look, here, uh, we offer you this because we see it as important and necessary to uh, bring about justice for Aboriginal people 
It was a long, difficult process. You know, many difficult negotiations. It was, uh, it was a step-by-step, moment-by-moment -step, uh, uh, -moment process. And we had to be smart. We had to be nimble. We had to be quick. And uh, I think we were all of that. And so that moment, in the House of Commons, June 11, 2008, was the culmination of this long, difficult journey. And it was electric, the atmosphere. People cheering and uh, applauding and, you know, all of the entire house on, the, on their feet and uh, all kinds of people outside on, on uh, Parliament Hill, giant uh, television screens and uh, support workers and uh, drums and uh, in the House of Commons I'd never heard uh, the sound of uh, our drum and that was part of the uh, that moment and uh, when uh, the Aboriginal leaders walked down from the Prime Minister's office uh, to enter the, uh, the House of Commons. It was a pretty special moment. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today, we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong has caused great harm and has no place in our country. For so long, people have assumed that this was just an Indigenous issue. This is not. This is a Canadian issue. It is something that happened for 130 years because of Canadian laws, because of Canadian policies, um, and it's something, in fact, that Indigenous people had no say in. And so they just had to live with the consequences of it. I have my own experiences in residential school and uh, they're not good ones. But I, I, I choose at maybe 10, 11 years old to, to not to believe the, the, the accusations and the lies and that were being told to me by the nuns and the priests and the supervisors. Also been hurt in, in a physical way. I've also been hurt in a sexual way. And to take those and, and try and use them that where um, I've gained and I've strengthened my, my inner self, my inner persona, my inner personality, my inner spirit, whatever you want to call it. And to, to turn it into a positive light and say, um, I want to be able to make a difference in terms of, of, uh, of sharing with people, telling them my story but not from anger, but from love and compassion and forgiveness. I think uh, the spirit of, of the full scope of the settlement agreement, including um, the education credits, uh, really I think it's important to recognize that this settlement agreement and all its facets um, was a part of a really difficult process where people were involved. And I, I really feel strongly that the spirit of the idea of the personal credit program is important to embrace. That very notion that education was used as such a tool of hurt, literally to try to pour in or inculcate something different into our peoples to tear the, the Indian from the child, that I think it really is, um, I think, uh, a powerful sentiment that survivors who themselves say, we want to make sure this never happens again, and we want to break the pattern, break the chain um, between that hurt, that anger, that deep pain. Um, to future generations. The education credits, in some cases, survivors are saying, I want my grandchild to be able to use this. Um, the, the past may have been very difficult for me. Education was not a supportive development, uh, but we're learning from all of it, including the pain. Uh, for some reason, we've all experienced this, and now we're able to translate that into ensuring that the young people are supported. It, for, not only in an education that will support them to get a job or contribute uh, to the economy, 
but as is the way amongst Indigenous peoples, to be a functioning, healthy contributor to society in general. And I've heard, certainly through my 30 years of ad advocacy for residential school um, students, is that uh, you know, they have lost their language, they've lost their culture, the loss of opportunities for education, training, all of those kind of things were real for them. And we thought, you know, if there ever was an opportunity for them to either benefit uh, individually by having even some funds available uh, to either return to school or to take courses or to attend culture programs, language programs, whatever it is they wanted, that they should have that opportunity. So I think it benefits, you know, not only individuals, but their families, and in some cases their whole communities, should they pool their credits uh, for language programs or, or cultural programs that may be appropriate to rebuilding what they've lost through residential school. So I do plan on using it, and I want to use it towards my daughter, who is already in the university. There is real learning happening in Canada right now through the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, sparked by the settlement agreement and the, and the powerful stories of survivors. And, I might add, uh, the incredible energy, enthusiasm, uh, and engagement of young people, knowing that they've got aunties, uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents, and those who've gone on that suffered through this incredibly uh, difficult chapter in our shared history. And what they're saying is we must transform, transform for our, our own families. Um, and the survivors are saying, we need to recognize that yes, we were victimized. Even those who came in, in the generations after uh, were part of the, the cycle of trauma and deep, uh, deep difficulties and social ills that still pervade, are still a reality in our communities. But we can say that it's this time in our history that we can um, um, remove ourselves from being only uh, described as victims uh, and move to be recognized as strong survivors, because that's what we are resilient in the face, having overcome incredible odds uh, to accomplish the things that we're seeing in our communities. It makes sense that if residential schools, under the guise of education, was a, used as a tool of oppression, used as a tool to hurt, used as a tool to divide, to literally tear children from the laps of their grandparents, that should not education now be used as a tool of freedom, inner freedom, as well as reconnection, to reconnect children with their grandparents, with their territories, with their languages, with their culture, and to encourage Canadians more broadly to join in this effort. You as well are a treaty person, irrespective of where you reside and if you are not of Indigenous heritage. Know that you have also inherited this, uh, this legacy, this, this history, and you can also play a part in the work of reconciliation. Education is about learning. Learning promotes and supports healing healing relationships within and between Indigenous peoples, as well as between Indigenous peoples in the state and Canadians, that's the work of reconciliation. And in many respects, that, that, that first steps are just being taken now.